the start that we keep on track. So, uh, okay, hi everybody again. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, now uh, our next speaker that is Michael Mahoney, who is um, associated with the Department of Statistics and the International Computer Science Institute at UC Berkeley. Uh, he's also director of the UC Berkeley Foundations of Data Analysis, ODA Institute, uh, that is uh, a sister tripod institute uh, at Berkeley that, that has a goal of deepening the theoretical foundations of data science. His research broadly covers algorithmic and statistical aspects of modern large scale data analysis. His work uh, covers theory and applications. Uh, on the theory side, he's interested in many problems related to randomized linear algebra, stochastic optimization, implicit regularization, local graph partitioning and approximation algorithms. And on the application side, it has a wide application spectrum going from internet, social media analysis, computer vision, national, natural language processing, social media information networks, genetics, bio, um, medical imaging, and many, many more. Uh, so Michael, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And we really look forward to your talk on continuous network models for sequential prediction. Uh, it's all yours. All right, thanks a lot. Um... And just double checking, you can still hear me. I just adjusted the uh, thing on my side. Yes. All right, good. So um, I just clicked on the um, Q&A, but it came up and I, it's all white, so I can't see it. So if, it, if there's any questions, I guess either unmute yourself and holler or I'll take them at the end. Or if you if you um, type it into the Q&A, maybe someone can interrupt and ask it because I can't actually see them, just FYI. Um, so yeah, so it's great to be here and um, thanks for the invitation. And I'm glad to have the chance to tell you about some of the work we've been doing recently. Um, at what sort of, I think it's an interesting interface. Um, and one way I, at least I think about this is you know, time in the sense of dynamical systems and, and differential equations and the like sort of is really a first class citizen in, in sort of a lot of scientific and engineering problems. Um, you formulate uh, physics and engineering in terms of differential equations involving space and time. You want to see how something evolves in time. You want to know if it's stable. Um, from the perspective of machine learning theory, um, it, typically that's not the case, I think. I mean, <laughs> it's not a first class citizen in the same way. Oftentimes um, things are formulated in terms of a classification or regression problem. And certainly you can tack on time. I mean, there's a long history of time series models and, um, and the like, but you know, one way to view them is they're least squares, they're logistic, they're whatever. We attack on some temporal dependencies between the coordinate axes. And so um, it's, it's sort of the obvious temporal dependencies, but um, you know, it's not, fun, it's not fundamentally temporal. You're calling algorithms that are not fundamentally temporal. And so, um, as I said, so I've done a lot of work on foundations of data. And I think sort of one of the big foundational questions really is how do you integrate, let's say, um, domain driven scientific and engineering problems, many of which are formulated in terms of differential equations and dynamical systems with sort of fundamental machine learning and, um, and statistical techniques, many of which, uh, which are not. Sometimes they're more, uh, Date, you know, they're, they're more data driven rather than domain driven, and sometimes they're formulated in terms of classification or regression, but not as temporal problems per se. And um, on the one hand, you know, you put a T somewhere, you use some domain insight, and stuff works out. On the other hand, there's a whole bunch of little gotchas, and so we've been looking at some of the gotchas to see um, where this integration works better and worse. And so, what I wanted to tell you about is some work we've done recently on what I'm calling continuous models, continuous. Um, most of what I'll be talking about today is neural network models for time series or sequential predictions. So we want to predict in time. So this is work with a bunch of people. Um, in particular, Ben Erickson's done a lot of, um, been sort of the lead or the point for, for a lot of this stuff. So he was a postdoc with me, he's at Pittsburgh now, and, um, and he's doing great work sort of in this area. So he's been the uh, main um, lead for a lot of this effort. All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna try and switch screens. So here's the roadmap. Um, some maybe introductory thoughts, and then a couple different things. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about continuous times RNNs, a couple different flavors of that, and then something that I'll call dynamic autoencoder. And then I'll wrap up with some sort of general ideas, but um, hopefully you see how this fits into a broader range of things that we're, that we're thinking about. All right, so um, <clears throat> it probably doesn't need to be said, but this is just to have a slide with some pretty pictures, but to sort of il illustrate, I mean, maybe the way we're thinking about it. I think there's a lot of interesting um, and very practical problems that exhibit, let's say, multi-scale and nonlinear temporal properties. And, um, you know, on the right is there's, there's a climate models, there's weather patterns um, moving in from the right. I mean, there's a lot of differential equations in, in aerospace engineering. You want to understand how fluid flows over, over a wing. Um, maybe you don't care about how fluid flows over a wing, but you want, you know, to develop better cars and so you want to understand the hydrodynamics there. There's a data-driven aspect, but there's a domain-driven aspect. Um, I think those areas are feeling pain in terms of how to integrate ML methods with what they do. Something that might be a little less obvious, but I think it's also the case is on the, on the far left, there's a lot of interest in sort of self-driving cars, for example. And you think about how is a self-driving car gonna understand things? And I think a lot of attention to machine learning goes to, well, these are images. So do computer vision and do image analysis. And I think um, in many cases, that's not the pain point for a self-driving car company. Basically, because they're not taking images, they're taking video series. You know, they're taking they're taking time series of video, and you know, a toy example is well, I want to insulate myself against adversarial examples, and by adversarial examples, I mean you change one pixel, um, and you change a stop sign into a yield sign. Wouldn't that be bad? And I think if you talk to self-driving car companies, they have a whole list of a dozens of things they worry about. That is not the top of the list. I mean, they're worried about the car is causing problems with users, but they're not worried about you know, one pixel changing a stop sign to a yield sign. Why? I mean, how would they determine whether something's a stop sign at all? I mean, there's a lot of junk in this picture on the left, and maybe there's a stop sign up there, maybe not. But um, they might, for example, look at the flow field vectors of the video, not look at the images, look at the video, look at the time series of the video, and can you develop a model for that? And if something looks like an octagon and it's coming at you at a certain rate, um, in many cases, that will be a better feature for whether something's a stop sign. So I think thinking about um, time as a first class citizen will help a lot of applications like this, you know, beyond internet advertising and social media to where um, um, time maybe is, is, is a first class citizen or should be a first class citizen. So I think there's a range of engineering and scientific problems, but also these that, are, that get more attention in terms of AI and ML. So, you know, neural networks provide a flexible way to model all sorts of things, um, including time series. And so that's what we'll talk about today. <clears throat> and the idea maybe is to um, map what you've seen, some function that looks like a wiggle, like a sinusoid or whatever this thing is on the bottom um, that you've seen so far and make a prediction in, in, in terms of the future. And of course, usually the good prediction in terms of the future is just predict the current value. I mean, so time series modeling, I think, is one of these areas where... It's, it's relatively um, higher investment than just classifying cats and dogs. I mean, you need to know more about the area, the details matter. Um, you shouldn't have a null model that, that, um, that, that, you know, for example, doesn't beat that trivial straw man that I just sort of said. So that's the good. The bad is neural networks, there's a whole bunch of problems with it. They take obscene amount of time to compute, require lots of data. And at the end of the day, they're powerful function markers, but they're fairly brittle. And so that's that's known. People talk about that. And so one of the themes talking in, in what I'll be talking about is brittleness with respect to this, this these these temporal issues. All right. <clears throat> so here's the static, the non-temporal version. I have a stop sign and I convert it to a yield sign. So here on the left is a penguin. I add random noise. It seems like random noise, but not really. Buried in that thing is is an adversarial perturbation, and I turn it into a cat or a panda or something totally different. And of course, with high confidence. So um, this is sort of the sort of example that gets attention. And uh, we wanna talk about being robust to things like that along the temporal axis. So we're gonna be using ideas from dynamical systems and we're gonna think about machine learning models and particularly these neural network models from a dynamical systems perspective and maybe um, how to control it. And I think this is sort of a power, use some, so, some tools here to study the stability and long-term behavior of, of these models. So a, a simple sort of toy example is you want to run a power method, you iterate, um, with the matrix vector multiplies. And if you're not careful, the largest eigenvalue, if it's 1.01, .01, you iterate that 50 times, you get a million. And if it's 0.99, you iterate 50 times, you get zero. Um, and so uh, you gotta be careful. That, that's a very simple example of an instability. There's a lot more subtle examples here. So we're gonna think about machine learning applied to various scientific applications, call it scientific ML. Um, 
and there's sort of a, it looks like there's a similarity, right? In machine learning, y equals f of x plus noise, a dynamical system, you have the, the temporal behavior, but, but there's a lot of subtleties here. Okay, so the hope is that the dynamical systems perspective here can give us a better understanding of some of these black box methods and, and develop better methods. <clears throat> so as an example of this, um, <clears throat> the basic building block of, of ResNets, which is a certain class of models, is these so-called residual units. X of t plus one is equal to X of t plus some residual. So you're not learning the next step, you're learning the delta, which, which is, a, is a useful sort of way to think about things in general. So um, the function R of T denotes the teeth residual model. It's, it's typically a nonlinear map. It's a matrix vector multiply filtered through some nonlinearity, parameterized by some parameters. And so the idea, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, but you, know, you have this first X of T, you're going to X of T plus one, but you're adding a delta, a residual unit. Now, <clears throat> If you know numerical analysis, you're tempted to say, well, this looks like a discrete approximation to something. All right, so if you now shift gears and say, let's consider in a diff dynamical system or a differential equation takes the form of equation two, dx dt, looks as, as a derivative, is equal to r, you know, and, and, and make r a function of x of t and theta of t. So now I've called, you know, put t's everywhere and, and made x a function of t. What have I done? Am I doing the same thing? Am I doing something different? And um, in a lot of cases in scientific computing and in engineering and science, you start with a dynamical system and you discretize. Here, you're really going the other way. I mean, there may or may not be a dynamical system here, right? I mean, if I follow the self-driving car, there may be. In other cases, there might not be. The model itself is just a discrete thing. And so it's tempting to say, well, the form of um, this model looks a little bit like a uh, forward Euler um, discretization of an ordinary differential equation x of t plus one is equal to x of t plus delta t times this residual unit. So importantly, this equation three is not the same as the first equation. So there's a difference is that you have delta t there. Okay, so let's say delta t equals one, then they look pretty similar. So is this mean that we've captured some temporal property or not? <clears throat> so um, slightly more generally, I could say, well, this, this r, this thing, this residual unit, what is that? Let's look inside. So algebraically, the residual unit sort of um, resembles a lot of numerical time-stepping methods. X of t is equal to t plus one is equal to x of t plus delta t, set that to be one or not, plus some numerical scheme. So the numerical key scheme could be Euler on the left, which is some box that I could hide the internal structure of. It could be midpoint where, where I couple those boxes together in a certain way. And if you're familiar with numerical sort of methods in midpoint, it's the usual thing. We're just chaining two things together and I choose these parameters to get things to cancel in the Taylor series expansion. I could use RK4. There's, there's a range of versions of RK4 um, that I could use. So um, these ideas have, have been used for a range of different um, you know, model design methods. And so, I mean, if you're familiar with these sort of techniques, um, people have designed various architectures using these ideas. All right. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, um, when these numerical integrator, when these ideas are used in scientific computing, in the solution of differential equations and other things, you typically have a continuous problem and then you discretize it. And you want to say, geez, um, I have a discrete thing. In what sense is it meaningfully continuous? And you have to pass some numerical integration tests and say that as, as, as the time step gets smaller, the model gets better, something like this. And there's a range of ways to do that. Um, in ML, we have something that looks syntactically sort of similar, um, but it's really actually quite different. You start with discrete data and then you say, geez, this looks like a discretization with time step one of an underlying dynamical system. And I try and use those, those ideas. So let's do this and let's apply this to a toy example. Um, so we have this, this, is, this particular figure is drawn from a continuous in-depth neural networks paper that we posted a year or two ago. Um, we have a, 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 an extension of it that I'm alluding to now that I'll allude the results to where we're really using the numerical integrator um, tests as, as, a, as a filter, as, a, as an inductive bias, as a model selection on choosing a meaningfully continuous model. And that'll be up in, uh, in a few weeks, but ping me if you're interested, but that'll be up in a few weeks on the archive. And so um, <clears throat> I think simply viewing um, the syntactic form as sufficient to justify that you have are capturing anything meaningfully dynamic is is fairly misleading and and so um it's an empirical question whether it's true and, and i think we're going to ask the question and see that the answer is that it's not so um i think the analogy to res of resnet to ford euler is is at best incomplete let's say um so on the let's look at the left so this is the good news on the left i have the ground truth in blue 
um, just a simple pendulum. This is a nonlinear pendulum, but one where we have a particular form where we have a clean analytic form. So we know the exact answers, um, but it's not, it's not a um, well, linear pendulum. Um, I, I could do numerical Euler, meaning I solve it just using the Euler discretization from a numerical analysis, but can I get the orange? And it's fine for a, a cycle or two, and then it diverges. And if I use midpoint or RK4, it would be fine for more cycles, and then it would diverge, just what you'd expect. If I use, let's call it ODE net Euler, which is, you know, sort of a, a um, I think the people call it neural ODEs, but, you know, it's essentially a learned machine learning model where I have parameters in the form of the block I had a few slides ago, but for the Euler discretization, then I get the green and it's on the nose. It's very good. And um, I could do the same thing, but use the RK4 block. And it's also on the nose. Very good, right? And if I ran this out farther, you'd see a slight difference, but for many, many cycles, it's fine. Um, that's the good news. Okay, so what, what did I do here? What I did is I generated a bunch of data, time step one, trained the models in ODE net four Euler and ODE net RK4. And then I predicted out at time step one. <clears throat> good. Um, numerical Euler breaks, ODE net Euler works, big success. Good. So now if, if I'm meaningfully continuous though, this integrator shouldn't just work in the syntactic form at delta t equals one, it, it should work at delta t equals two, maybe a little bit less good, or delta t equals a half, a little bit better. So on the right, the left is the good, the right's the bad. Um, on the right, let's ask, I train this at delta t equals one, and now I want to evaluate it on data where delta t equals two, or a half, or a quarter, or an eighth. And so forward Euler in black here, gradually decreases and get worse. That's just what you had to get from a numerical analysis book, except I, I might have the X and Y axes in a non-familiar way. But midpoint gets better faster and RK4 gets better faster. So the sense in which RK4 is better than midpoint, better than Euler from a numerical analysis is because starting at large time, going to small time, meaning on the plot on the right, coming in from the right, um, RK4 goes down faster. Now look at the trained models. The, um, the red, it, the machine learning model, the ODE net Euler, ODE net trained with a midpoint block and ODE net trained with the RK4 block. And what you see is that the red gets better and better. And at time step one, when the test data is time step one, it's great. I mean, your error is you know, very small, but if time step is two or a half or a quarter or an eighth, it chokes and does much worse. So really you're overfitting to the temporal discretization. I mean, for this particular problem, midpoint gets gradually better, flattens out, and then levels off and goes down more gradually. Similarly, RK4 goes down, flattens out, and then decreases very gradually. So really what you're doing is um, trying to provide sort of a, a learning a time step. But really what you're doing with, with the Euler discretization is learning a good discrete model. But you have not learned a good continuous model in, in, in the sense in which um, that word is used by people who do numerical differential equations and numerical implementations of dynamical systems, which is basically take something, cut the time step in half, do you get better and at what rate? So, um, so the idea here is that the red and the, the uh, purple and the blue are machine learning models trained with machine learning methodology. It would make ICML and NURBS people happy. And there's no time there. You do cross validation, you do whatever. Um, in order to get better temporal properties, you need to filter through something that knows about time, like a numerical integration test. And if you do that, for this example, Euler chokes, midpoint and RK4 do well. Um, for other, there's nothing special about that. In certain cases, depending on the noise properties of the data, et cetera, et cetera Euler could do well or midpoint and RK4 can, could choke. So we know that. So the point is that um, in order to capture meaningfully dynamic or temporal information, existing training methods typically don't do that. And so I think a lot of papers that you might come across as in particular in machine learning venues, uh, well, in, in that and scientific venues don't do that. So, um, so that's something that's informed a bunch of stuff what we did. And I'm gonna talk about a range of other things um, in, the, in the balance of the talk, but um, <laughs> some of those have been integrated with th that idea, some have not, but, but this is sort of the, you know, the baseline that, that we wanna combine dynamical systems ideas um, in a meaningfully way that passes a machine learning methodology. So you've trained the parameters well, which at time step one, and doing inference at that time step, all of these models do, but also learn something meaningfully continuous. Because if you're going to feed this into a, a simulation or a, a, a differential equation model or something, if it does well at time step equals one, but now the scientists use time step equals a half or two and the whole thing chokes, that's, that's not a good thing. All right. <clears throat> stability of linear, of, of neural networks is a range of notions of stability. Um, but basically it has to do with the, um, the trajectories don't diverge in, in certain ways. Um, 
one example of, of this is if you're doing a training process is the so-called exploding and vanishing gradients. And, and so in the simplest case that you're running a, um, a power method or, or, or you know, an iterative method, um, are the eigenvalues magnitudes above or below one or equal to one? And if they're equal to one, you're at sort of a, a reg regime where they're stable. And one, in the other case, they explode. In the other cases, they vanish. Depending on the setup, one of these may be a problem and the other may not. But typically, most ML methodologies don't validate for this directly. <laughs> then someone realizes the problem and invents a method to validate it. So we would like to combine the two in a little bit more principled way. All right. <clears throat> Maybe let me pause for a second to make sure that People are still connected and if there's any sort of questions or violent objections, but I wanted to go through um, so the particular examples we do in light of this. I have one quick question. So in the uh, last example you showed, the sampling frequency during training was also one second? We trained on one second. And for example, did you have, did you try other sampling schemes, like not the schemes, uh, uh, other frequencies to see that this coincidence that exactly OD net oil drops at um, one second, like is consistent? Yeah, yeah. So, so the point here is that you're fitting to the temporal discretization. You're not fit, you're, there's, no, there's no time here. You're fitting to the temporal discretization. Um, if we trained at half a second, we'd see a dip at half a second. If we trained at a range of times between a half and two, we'd see a smudged out version of this. Um, so the, the point is that, um, there's a temporal discretization, it's sharp because we train to exactly one second or smudged out if we train to a range of things at a certain temporal scale, but we're not gonna get anything a factor of two or 10 smaller or larger because um, unless we, we ask, you know, this, this sort of numerical integration test question. If you ask that question, you can determine the answer. So you get that or a smudged out version of that depending on exactly how you do this. Thanks. Anything think, else? Um... I think Andrea Anissa wanted to make a question uh, in the Q and A now. Just like uh, neural networks are nonlinear, do they have eigenvalues? I uh, this is Rick Blom. Um, I, okay, so I'll, I'll get to that in the, in the second part here. This is a this is a, a, a quote real neural network. There's nonlinearities, there's bells and whistles. You can talk about stability. You can talk about dynamical systems. In the simplest case, it's a matrix vector multiplied as eigenvalues. Everything's determined by the eigenvalues. More generally, it depends on other stuff. There's Lipschitz constants and so on. And that's some of the stuff I'll talk about in the second half. So the, the simple example is if you're doing a matrix vector multiply, it depends on the, the norm of the, the magnitude of the, uh, the eigenvalues. And so you got to control that. More generally, you got to control other things. So in, 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 a, in a more realistic neural network, not one layer with no nonlinearities. I mean, there's, there's, it's not just the eigenvalues that it boils down to. I guess, like, if I, if I may, like, while we're here, um, following the the question that Maher was saying, like, m m maybe this is like getting to a to a head. But if if your goal is to to learn this dynamical system, then one could argue that like the time between samples should be part of the information that you, you should have, right? So uh, for example, yeah, like uh, sampling at different times and intervals and having some, yeah, randomized time, like intervals to, to sample will probably give better information to, uh, to learn in the, the F of X, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the question is how, how does time enter? And, and if you, if you, if you, um, evaluate your model in certain ways. Training, testing curves is one way, driving training error to zero and trying to control the implicit regularization with batch norm and with, with uh, dropout and all this is a different way. Um, that methodology does not guarantee anything about time. So this is a slightly oversimplified version of what I don't wanna say, but that methodology doesn't guarantee anything about time. Um, if you're doing numerical analysis and you're doing scientific computing and implementations of, um, of uh, differential, partial differential equations, numerical integrators, um, time appears in a first class way. You use this discretization method or you use that precisely because it has certain properties as, as delta T is varied. And um, so when you say, if, if I'm trying to learn a dynamical system, time should enter somehow, I mean, I think the specific question is how does it enter in 
the um, the training testing procedure, you drive training error to zero. Do you force your do you force the user, the, you know, the scientist that doesn't know any ML theory, to generate um, data at a range of temporal granularities? I mean, in a sense, okay, we generated that example at delta t equals one. But if you had generated a delta t equals, you know, order of magnitude one, you would have seen the same thing. It would have been a smudged out dip, but you would have seen the same sort of thing. So now you're forcing the, you know, your, your ML methods to learn a dynamical system doesn't work for, for general input data. It only works if the user gives it a very carefully um, laid out input data. And, and in a lot of cases, that's fine. That's sort of, quote, feature engineering. You know, I mean, it, clearly the algorithms depend on the input data. But um, but the methodology doesn't respect it at all, and it would fail if you didn't do that. So I think that's the that's the sort of the way we're thinking about that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and there's there's another question from Andrea Panis. It says like, okay, so from an American analysis point of view, I believe that all the net midpoint and all the net RK four also choke. If they didn't, the error should go down uh, as dt square and dt four respectively. But instead, they don't. Do you agree? Um, okay, so what, what the question is here basically is the black curves here, so I just went back to this example nonlinear pendulum, that's a good question. The black curves here, um, look at the right, march in, because decreasing delta t, we're on log scale here, march in from the, uh, the far right of this plot, the curves go down. That means something good is happening. Forward Euler goes down at some rate, midpoint goes down faster, RK4 goes down faster. These things do not go to zero. They go down to about machine precision, 10 to the minus eight or 10 to the minus 16, and then they flatten out. So I didn't show that here because then I'd you know, lose resolution up at this regime that I'm interested in, but they'll all go down and flatten out. Ford Euler will flatten out you know, three blocks down, RK4 will flatten out you know, right here at, at machine precision. So um, <clears throat> depending on the properties of the data, um, mid all of these methods, but in particular here, midpoint and RK4, at some time scale, go down the, the ML learned version, the ODE net midpoint and the ODE net RK4, roughly parallel the numerical version. And you see that. And then they, they don't flatten out, but, but they decrease much more gradually. And the way to think about that is, you know, you're, you're at the sort of noise level of the data. And so um, in the same way as, as the integrators will flatten out at machine precision, because that's what you're controlling, here they'll flatten out at 10 to the minus four or whatever, depending on the noise properties of the data. So when I say choke, um, it, I don't mean they flatten out, because clearly they're going to flatten out unless the noise properties of the data are at 10 to the minus 16. What I mean is that you see this big dip. This dip is a, a signature of overfitting. So you see this big dip in the red, the big dip in the ODE nut Euler. And from midpoint and RK4, they're gradual. They go down at the rate you'd expect from the perspective of numerical analysis, and then they go down at a much more gradual rate because the noise properties of the data can't support that, you know, that, that it goes down this fast. But um, with midpoint and RK4, in this example, you don't see this deep dip that you see for OD not OD. So that's choking. That means you're really overfitting. So in particular, the red is a good model if you're interested in discrete models, but it's not a good continuous model. That's the claim. Whereas the other ones are good continuous models. Um, they can't go to zero just because the noise properties of the data don't permit that, but, but they don't overfit to the, to the delta t equals one. <clears throat> and that's, an, that's actually, thanks for that question. That's actually a very important point here. Okay, does that make sense? I, I believe it does, but. All right. All right, so let me go through a bunch of other things. And um, I'll go through these things a little bit more quickly because I think the, the, the next things I think they're a little more standard. There's more technical stuff and you, know, you can point you to the papers. Um, and I think the interesting thing here is starting to scrape below the surface. Some of these are a year or two old, some are a little bit older. Scrape below the surface and think about it in light of the methodology I was just talking about. So I wanna talk about a couple different versions of continuous time RNNs that we've looked at. So the basic recurrent unit here is um, you have a hidden state T plus one, and how does that depend on information? So there's a hidden to hidden matrix times H of T, the hidden state of times T. Input to hidden matrix, call it U. The input to this thing is X of T. There may be a shift, a bias. And then you filter it through some sort of nonlinearity, call that sigma. So um, these recurrent units are, are, are networks of feed forward constructions. And um, among other things, they can be used, um, they can use their hidden state, call it a memory if you want, to process variable length sequences. Um, <coughs> 
these things are known to have stability issues and are difficult to train um, because of the exploding and vanishing gradient thing I mentioned. Okay, so um, Lipschitz recurrent neural networks don't use the general construction, um, which could have, you know, who knows what model, do something like where you have a residual piece. So we sort of proposed a continuous time recurrent unit. Um, we'll describe the hidden states evolution with, with two parts, sort of a well understood linear component, which is a matrix vector multiply. <clears throat> and then a, a correction, a nonlinear correction, let's call it a Lipschitz nonlinearity, where you have hidden to hidden matrix times hidden, input to hidden times input, plus, plus a bias or a shift filtered through a nonlinearity, where the nonlinearity you have control. So this, the, the question was about stability. Um, here, the stability is going to manifest itself in terms of a Lip Lipschitz parameter. So we're controlling that separately than the linear component. This was an ICLR, I think, was last year. <clears throat> um, assuming that the uh, the nonlinearity, the second order term, um, has is M Lipschitz, then uh, we can prove that the method is exponentially stable under under certain conditions on A and W. So the exact statement of the theorems here. Um, the proof um, is a little bit technical. Um, intuitively, we're getting this sort of exponential stability if the matrix has eigenvalues. Um, the eigenvalues of the matrix have real or imaginary parts, and the real parts have to be sufficiently negative to counteract the expanding trajectories and the nonlinearity, right? So you're not doing matrix vector multiply. There's a nonlinearity that will expand something, and so you got to be sufficiently negative to compensate for that. That's what this, this theorem is saying. Um, <clears throat> The symmetric um, or skew symmetric hidden to hidden matrix um, is getting is slightly more into the weeds. Um, we had a particular form for the decomposition and using this construction, we could bound the spectrum in terms of these parameters. Um, whether this, you know, you could probably have other constructions. I mean, the point is here, um, we, we gave a particular construction that allowed us to bound the parameters um, that allowed us to bound that stability. <clears throat> Um, and it had a very natural interpretation in terms of skew symmetry. Um, this symmetric skew scheme allows us to construct these hidden to hidden um, um, dynamics to uh, get moderate decaying growth behavior. And here's sort of a proof by picture. Um, depending on how you choose the parameters, these parameters are the same as these parameters on this page that I didn't go into the details on. But depending on the values of the parameters, um, you have eigenvalues that are spread out, or you can pull the eigenvalues all to be, you know, have, have negative uh, real components. So this is sort of like, you know, the way we thought about this, we don't have any precise results here is you get into the weeds of the numerical integrators and you combine things this way or that way to get the, the tail expansion, um, the terms canceling to certain orders. This is a little bit like that. We're in the weeds of the alpha beta. We have a particular construction in terms of the skew symmetric matrix. And if we choose the parameters the right way, we can get all the eigenvalues on the negative half plane. Okay, putting it all together, we get a re Lipschitz recurrent neural network, which has this functional form. Um, hidden to hidden, matrix vector multiply, a um, bunch of subscripts and parameters, plus a nonlinearity, hidden to hidden, input to hidden, bias. Um, <clears throat> Michael, can I ask you one question here? Uh, question, yeah. Like, yeah, so um, what, uh, in what sense is your goal stability here? Um, like, um, so I guess like, what was, yeah, so why in this particular model you, you would like to make this well, stable. Uh, yeah, yeah. so one, I mean, okay, so if we had written this some number of years ago, we would have said, well, maybe we could do better training because they're now are stable. We wanted a couple things, one of which is stability, another which is more robust models. The stability, I, I think, in a bunch of cases, we don't have a precise statement of this, but in a bunch of cases, we'll provide, let's call it what machine learning people call an inductive bias towards, towards more stable models. So whether or not it's good for training, it also will give you more robustness in a range of senses. And, and the plot I'll have in a, in a slide or two gets that. I mean, I think it's a fair question to say, what, in what sense, what is stability buying you? It, it, could, it could buy you something in a dynamical system sense. It could buy you something at the training stage. It could buy you something at the inference stage or the out of sample inference stage. And so some of the results I'll be talking about later, we'll, we'll tap into that also. So it, it could be any of those. We were particularly interested in those latter points that, that the, the model sort of, it is stable in an, either an inference or a, um, a, a uh, call it a transfer learning sense. We apply it to slightly different data. So I mean, the adversarial perturbation is essentially a statement of non-robustness of a model, just in model space. Yeah. So uh, similar question. So I can totally uh, see that, for example, if the recurrent architecture <laughs> is exponentially stable, it's gonna contract the adversarial perturbations, for instance, right? It makes it more robust. 
but uh, on the other hand we can also argue that it uh, it may limit the expressivity of the neural network because all the trajectory mm -hmm. is always contracting and it can it may not be able to sufficiently explore the space is that yeah so correct? i think i think you're right and and that's the that's the trade off to play i mean you know just turing bit sequences are pretty expressible but there's problems with it right so the ball game is 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 looking at that trade off space i think what we're trying to do from from that from the perspective of that question, I think what we're trying to do is understand how to combine the the uh, the scientific computing, the numerical analysis sort of techniques from dynamical systems in a principled way with the machine learning methodology to provide what they'd call an inductive bias. So we're not just doing something arbitrary, but we are providing a bias. We 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 want the, we want things to be less expressible, and we want things to be less expressible in a way, for example, that doesn't give us that dip. At the temporal discretization, you know, we want things to be less expressible in a way that provides an inductive bias to getting some continuity in time or some robustness in time. Um, there's you know, so there's one more question um, yeah. related. I think it's like uh, very interesting. Uh, are these Lipschitz RNNs similar to unitary orthogonal RNN? <clears throat> That's question one. And the second one: Is there a proof that uh, this form of A gives the Lipschitz constant, which is strictly smaller than one, or is it mainly an experimental result? Um, we have a theorem. I don't recall whether we have that statement that was strictly smaller than one, but, but but we have empirical results. But in this and some of the other papers, we have a bunch of th theory on the robustness. Um, I don't know whether we have that exact result. Um, so this statement um, will say something about the eigen uh, value as being strictly negative, and we have mm -hmm. a lower bound on on a certain singular value, which I don't think was the thing being asked about. We're going to have a bunch of empirical results on robustness, and we're going to have theoretic results similar to that later on on slightly different models. Um, I guess there's a mix between, and maybe they're asking questions about uh, like discrete versions of similar problems. Uh, because I, yeah, I agree with you. This you need like the real part of taking by the strictly negative. Yeah. Yeah. And the other question was about the relationship to um, what's it called? Orthogonal, orthogonal um, unitary RNN. Yeah. Um, yeah, think of that as a first cousin in prior art. I mean, um, we could I, argue about details, but you know what, what they want to do there is to say, do a unitary rotation so that your eigenvalues stay the same. And that has implications for training and expressivity. So that, that's related, yeah. <clears throat> all right, so putting it all together, we have this. Um, we can do continuous time um, training of continuous time recurrent units and ask the same questions we asked before, um, where you have the hidden state goes to the hidden state plus a numerical scheme or delta t times a numerical scheme. Um, we haven't filtered this through the um, numerical validation test, but you could. I mean, just because the numerical validation test is the, is the result that we said I said would be putting up on the archive in a week or two. So this, this result was from last year. Empirical evaluation, um, if any of you have published in I, machine learning venues, you need a table with numbers or you're in bold. So here's the table of numbers that were in bold. What we're looking at is this, this permuted pixel by pixel um, image, um, which tries to capture long range memories. And I think, I think it's a fair comparison here that, that um, the accuracy on this ordered permuted pixel by pixel image um, is, is, is state of the art here. Um, with, with Euler and RK4, I mean, you're at the third decimal, so you can argue about which one's better here, but let's take that offline. Um, robustness with respect to input perturbations, we see in a bunch of cases, and I think this is, um, in a sense, whether you're, I don't argue about the third digit of significance here. I, I think the more interesting thing is the robustness with respect to input perturbations. The Lipschitz RNN, um, x-axis here is the amount of noise, y-axis is good with good up in terms of uh, test accuracy and, um, we do better for you know factor of two more than purple and, and better than the other ones. So there's a vein, a range of ways we've got salt and pepper, a range of ways you could do input noise and, and, and you're robust with respect to that. <clears throat> so that's Lipschitz and RNNs, sort of an extension or variant of that is what we'll call noisy RNNs. Um, similar sort of flavor, similar sort of setup. Um, here you can think of this in two steps. Let's say add a leaky integrator, maybe a damping term, hidden state is equal to alpha hidden plus something. You can inject noise, hidden state is equal to alpha hidden plus something plus a bit of noise. Setting the parameters the right way, you get an Euler approximation, an Euler Meyerum approximation to a stochastic differential equation. If you're familiar with SDEs, this is the usual um, setup. You have Brownian motion, you have diffusion and drift. Um, 
what you're allowed, what we're able to do here is to inject noise sort of very precisely. Think of an adversarial perturbation as, as part of the training pipeline, you take an image and you, and you tweak it in, in, in a way that is um, worst case inside a unit ball. You could, you could inject noise in, at, sort of in the inner loop of the training process. So it's, it's gonna smooth something out. Um, so the input signal, um, we, we have the following SDE, it's the Edo formulation, if you're familiar with that. Um, we have the usual drift and uh, diffusion terms and the noise in injection you should really think of as a stochastic learning strategy. It's a fairly precise way to sort of robustify the uh, input data in a, in a certain sense against model perturbations. And we'll see the same sort of thing. So amount of noise, test accuracy, um, in this case, noisy RNNs are red and it's, it's much more robust across a, a range of different types of white noise, salt and pepper noise, various sorts of adversarial noise. Um, some real data on, on EKG we've looked at. This is actually particularly interesting. I'm not gonna have enough time to go into details on this, but same sort of things. R reds you know, far off to the right, much better in terms of uh, multiplicative white noise. Uh, here, this is multiplicative versus additive white noise. Um, so a range of robustness metrics that we've learned. Um, there's a theorem making precise the sense in which um, this particular noise injection scheme is, is performing a, a type of implicit regularization. And so we are, this is providing an inductive bias. Implicit regularization means you're solving implicitly something of the form F plus lambda G, right? You're adding capacity control. So, so we're minimizing expressivity and not minim reducing expressivity in some sense. Okay. Um, one other thing, I can skip the dynamic if there's, if there's a, a, a time issue, but one other thing I wanted to at least mention was um, LEMS, long expressive memory. Um, how do you think about long, long time scale. So one example is to think of a two time scale ODE. So this is a simple example of a differential equation with two time scales. Think of it a stiff differential equation with this fast and slow time scales. And so you might say, I wanna learn something on a short time scale, but also understand the long time scale. Um, question, what about in between? What about longer time scales? So we've done a lot of work on sort of heavy tailed structure in weight matrices, in, in time autocorrelations and a range of things. And these are very, very ubiquitous and very hard to deal with. Um, in this context, we can do this. We can have a hidden to hidden, hidden to weight, the similar set of set up before. We can try and do that in a two time scale um, um, sense. We can also um, ask about a multi-scale version of this. And so we have a, a multi-scale version of this. The equations at the bottom um, are the multi-scale version of the, of the two time scale, um, the two time scale uh, differential equation up at the top. Um, this I think is a particularly interesting a direction because these these long time scales, um, there's a lot of sort of empirical and theoretical we, we and others have done to sort of suggest that um, good models are not models that you know have Frobenius norms that are small or what a lot of sort of statistical learning theories is suggesting, but uh, models that that have correlations cooked into them. It could be spatial correlations in an image. It could be call it sequential correlations in natural language. It could be temporal correlations if you're learning time series, and so you want to learn longer and longer correlations. And so the better models, if, if you're learning a, a, an autoencoder or something, are ones that with or without labeled data, you know, um, cook in correlations over many size scales or length scales or time scales here. So having a multi-scale version is very nice. With this setup, um, we can take this, we can take a discretize a system of, of ODEs. Now you get into a bunch of other questions that if you know um, numerical differential equations and, and related things, maybe in the, the back of your mind and what I was discussing previously. Now we can use not just Euler and RK4, we can start to ask questions about um, implicit, explicit time-stepping methods, um, Verlet integrators, things like this. Um, we have a couple of those in the pipeline. The initial result we have here is to look at implicit, explicit time-stepping. Um, this particular model that we're talking about here is gonna minimize an exploding and vanishing gradient. There's a result that we maintain the universal approximation guarantee. You might wanna sacrifice that at some point. Um, but it's also a universal approximator of a multi-scale dynamical systems in a certain sense. Um, the results um, on, on a range of multi-scale learning tasks are, are state of the art and I think actually quite good. Um, so with that, it's, it's one minute before um, time. Let me just say, I'm gonna skip the dynamic autoencoders. If anyone uh, has questions, you know. So you we have until 2 p.m., right, Maher? So I think okay. it's fair that you yeah, have received since... many questions like okay. during the talk that you continue. Um, so yeah. All right. don't limit yourself. So maybe let me pause for a second because the dynamic autoencoder is a little bit older and, and I can downweight that. Maybe I should pause 
for a second and see if there's any violent objections or questions so far, and then I'll describe what the what, what we're doing with what we did with the dynamic autoencoders. Is there any uh, questions on what we had, or should I march on? Um, no, not right now. Okay. All right. So, so we started off with this numerical integration test. We showed you something that these these neural ODEs or ODE nets really are fitting to the time scale they're, they're, the data come from. Um, we suggested this numerical integration test. We talked about a bunch of continuous times RNNs that predated this numerical integration test. Now we can tie the two together, ask about more sophisticated versions of combining numerical integration. You can imagine how this is useful or, or could be useful for combining machine learning models in a principled ways with a range of engineering and scientific systems. Um, so let me shift slightly, but still related to what we're going to call here dynamic autoencoders. So the road here on the, on the figure is bending a little bit. So um, here we consider a similar problem. Um, we're gonna we want to learn a model that learns some sort of map. X of t plus one is, is f of x of t. Um, during inference time, we're going to want to iterate that map, f to the k power. Um, and um, this will typically not succeed over long time horizons for issues related to the stability, but some of the details are a little bit differently. What we have here is the general idea is to design a class of models that's going to consist of let's say three components, this is a 10,000 foot view. A, um, an, an encoder, you can think of this as a featureizer um, if you want, um, which will embed the input, this flow field into a, into a low dimensional latent space. We're gonna have a model that propagates this in time, a dynamics, and then we're gonna have a decoder. And so, you know, think of the SVD, U sigma V transpose. If I iterate that process or even simpler as spectral theorem, U sigma U transpose, if I multiply that by itself, I get U sigma U transpose, U sigma U transpose, that inner U transpose U drops out because of an identity and I get U sigma squared U transpose. So I iterate that. So what I want to do here is to iterate that. And if I can say in some sense that the decoder times the encoder is an identity, then I can iterate this whole map and say encoder, dynamics, iterate, decoder. Now that's not going to be perfect, but if, if we can say that the encoder the decoder times the encoder is an approximate identity, maybe that'll be good enough. I mean, the so the decoder encoder, the encoder decoder is not going to be an identity. It'll, it'll be an identity transformation or projection down to the to the latent space. So it's really the decoder times the encoder that should be the approximate identity if we're going to allow ourselves to iterate this process. Um, so we want to train this by balancing um, a forward prediction and a reconstruction loss. So there's going to be a reconstruction loss and the iterated prediction. Um, this was done a couple of years ago. We now actually know some issues with this having to do with exact versus approximate constraints. Um, so let me just mention that, but not go into details about this. Um, so one on one will be learning these sort of coordinate transformations. Um, and you may be familiar, this is some of the ideas are related to people um, work on sort of Koopman based approaches. Um, so this is a little bit related to that. Um, so, uh, and we have results here, but let me just mention that. Okay, so one thing that I want to mention, so we have this notion of what we call the consistent dynamic autoencoder, where we have the encoder, we have some dynamics and we have the decoder. So this is the setup I had before. And the question is, how do you evaluate errors? So here, we're not going to talk about the convergence test. You could combine it, but this was about a year or two ago. And so um, a year and a half ago, I think. And so, um, uh, and so we didn't have that at the time. So here, we're not asking that question. Um, here we wanted to get the eigenvalues and have magnitude less than one. And what we used is a basically both a forward and backward consistency um, to stabilize weight. So this is the same issue we had before, but, but an older solution. Um, and the, the important thing here is that this map should be an approximate identity. You know, we, want, um, we want this map so it's, you know, to be an approximate identity. Um, and we can measure error in essentially a sort of a forward way versus backward way. And, and so let me not go into more details on that, but mention that. Um, for, and, and, and that, that, that symmetry is, is sort of, well, let me say it slightly more on that. That, that symmetry is cooked into the time, right? I mean, if you're, if you're forward, if, if you're cement, if, if you're, um, if, if you have this property forward in time, you'd want it to be, have this property backward in time. And if you error, measure the error in the machine learning pipeline one way, you're gonna introduce an asymmetry and get worse results than if you included both ways. And so we wanna include it both ways here. So that's why we have two terms. Um, so this is one of these sort of details, but if you don't include this, you're, you're gonna get um, consistency on one side, but not temporally in both ways. 
So that's the time axis is sort of symmetric. Think of the equations as, as being time reversible. And if you, only, if you only have one of these terms, you're not enforcing that. You're just enforcing consistency in one direction. I think that's sort of maybe intuitively the way to think about it. So here's the prediction errors over a time horizon of a thousand steps for um, uh, clean and noisy observations in, in, a, in a simple case. Um, the red here is the model that was trained with the, uh, this consistent, you know, in both directions um, model. Feed forward is, is one direction is, 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 is terrible. A range of other models that improve on that, like RNNs um, um, and, and a range of other models do better, but, but still break down much more quickly than if you enforce the consistency in both directions. Um, a more practical example is high dimensional fluid flow past a cylinder. Here's the cylinder and you have fluid going around both sides. Um, blue is the DAE, I mean, red is, is our version that includes that temporal consistency. Um, you're still- so Can you remind what was the- integration test, you're still converging only approximately. And so this will still increase if, if we went on the X axis, you know, factor of 10 more, but it, it's, it's better than the, uh, the version that doesn't include this. Yeah, sorry, right. can you remind what was uh, the DAE and versus? Uh... A DAE um, is going to be a straightforward version that that basically maybe I wasn't. So there's two there's two pieces. One is I want a um, a dynamic essentially a dynamic auto encoder, which mm -hmm. is going to encode, run a dynamics, and decode. Um, and what I want is to say that um, let me say uh, phi composed with psi, which means first do psi, the decoder, then do phi, the encoder. This is an approximate identity. And this is a soft, you know, this is, this is implemented as a, a soft constraint. You could add, implement it as a hard constraint. And we have results. Um, we had something in actually in, in NERPS last year talking about how a vanilla implementation from the ML perspective of, of physics informed models um, chokes because of hard versus soft constraint issues, if not careful. Um, we were doing it the naive way two years ago back then, but give it as a soft, as a suggestion, right? As, as you, you put the constraint on, but you're really optimizing it with SGD or whatever. So you're doing it along Lagrange dual. So it's only a soft constraint. Um, so here that's, that's this decoder composer the encoder gives you an identity. That's what this term's saying. And so this is just the usual plug this into a, an ML pipeline. Um, then we could augment that and, and have um, a consistent in both directions on encoder where we have that identity sort of in, in, in both temporal directions. Um, we, we want to enforce um, the dynamics in one direction and the dynamics in the other direction um, to, have to, 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 to be consistent in both directions. Um, and so, so there's, there's, the, there's the approach that takes none of this into account. There's the DA and there's a consistent DA. That, that's sort of the, the setup for these figures. I guess both are ours. I should say ours, but this was, I, I pulled the figure from the second paper. So DA was the prior work and we had to, you know, present it in anonymized form. So there's feed forward, there's the Hamiltonian, there's RNN, there's the original version, and then there's the more mature version. Similarly here. If, if I showed you the feed forward and the Hamiltonian, the other ones on this scale, they, they just perform much worse. They'd blow up, right? So I mean, the DAE actually is a big improvement relative to that. And the consistent version is an improvement on that still. All right. So with that, let me wrap up. Um, so I think there's, I hope that gave you sort of an overview of some of the things we've been thinking about in the last couple of years. I mean, I think there's, there's a broad sort of range of, I mean, I think if you want to do machine learning and these techniques, that's good. That's one thing. If you want to do engineering and science and stuff, that's another thing. I mean, I think one of the big, I mean, if you're interested in foundations of data, I think one of the leading order things is um, how do you combine um, domain driven models? And I think as, as one example of that, PDEs from science and engineering, where there's a huge infrastructure of knowledge and how people you know, run dynamical systems and solve differential equations and what it means to be continuous, et cetera, et cetera. How do you combine domain-driven models with, for lack of a better term, data-driven models from machine learning? Because the state-of-the-art data-driven models from machine learning in computer vision and natural language processing cook into the architecture lots of domain information, convolutions, attention, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, if, if you're training domain models well, 
you're probably cook, you know, you're, you're pre-processing the data in intelligent lays. It's like one of the questions where you, you, you pre-process it um, to get the time scales right. Um, so the question here is how do we build the foundations that bridges those two together where sort of both are first class citizens and one's really not subservient to the other. And so we tried to get a better understanding um, using this particular dynamical systems and, and these neural network models um, to enable us to design better models and a range of senses. Um, there was a bunch of weed level things in terms of the details of the architecture, the numerical convergence test, noise injection can be viewed as a stochastic learning strategy. Um, you could do a, a noise injection Gaussian, you could do non-Gaussian injection, you could do minimax, which is sort of what um, the adversarial perturbations are doing. And I think the empirical results show that continuous time RNNs and continuous time variants of a bunch of models um, get better performance in terms of training testing curves and or robustness with respect to range of input perturbations, which could be temporal, which could be adversarial, um, while still maintaining state-of-the-art sort of predictive performance. So um, here's the take-home figure. I think there's an interesting interplay between these two, but syntactic similarity is not enough. Just putting a T here doesn't mean it's continuous in time, and, and just putting a uh, training test doesn't mean you're, you're getting something, but there's a nice interplay here. So I think there's a lot of good open questions in the future. And these are some of the things we're thinking about recently. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, let me see if there's, I think we have time maybe for one or two more questions. Uh, oh, there's one here from Andrea Panitza. I says like, uh, the noise injection reminds me of um, a particular like archive paper. Uh, where they found that LSTMs trained on noisy data uh, will become less susceptible to the perturbation in the data, but with a longer relaxation time scale. Uh, do you think this is the same phenomenon, uh, even if that was for regular LSTMs, not for continuous time RNNs? So say again what exactly the result in the paper was? So they found that LSTMs trained on noisy data will become less susceptible to the perturbation in the data, uh, but uh, with a longer relaxation time scale. Uh, yeah, it, it might be. I mean, uh, by relaxation, uh, that's, that's with respect to the training process. There's two questions there. One is how robust are you to data perturbations, et cetera. Two is something about the dynamics of learning. Um, so it sounds like it's probably related to some of the things I was saying. I mean, not, not exactly the same, but, but would be related. Yeah, I think like the, the short answer. Yeah, and so from that perspective, I mean, a, a lot of papers will say something like that and then try and solve it in some way. And the, in a sense, we're trying to get, build the foundations for how to do that properly in, in, a, in a principled way with respect to both, uh, you know, the temporal aspect and the ML aspect, um, if, if I'm understanding what's being. Mm -hmm. To, but I don't know the particular result that you're talking about, so I, I could be off there. Um, I, I guess I, I have like a, a, a more broad question. Uh, it sort of comes back to some of your motivating examples. Um, or like, you know, like um, this work like very nicely talked about like how to use RNNs to, to basically model and <laughs> like get low order models of like dynamical systems. And, uh, I guess like um, my, my question was like, um, going back to your example of, okay, if I'm looking at like a self-driving car and I see like this like stop sign that is coming towards you, um, then do, can you classify it to be a stop sign more robustly because you're coming, data coming in a dynamic way. Um, I wonder whether you have looked at problems in terms of, uh, classification per se. So uh, are these like only problems of a learning dynamic systems or do you think of like a, a, a setting in which you have like a streaming data coming from this video where you want to classify, does there exist like a stop sign here or not? Or, or maybe is, is it like some of the uh, numerical examples that you show like something of the, of the, of the sort? Uh, my question- I mean, you're, you're asking, uh, you're asking, um would the methods be useful for solving classification problems that are not time series? Is that what you're asking? Um, no, no, no. I, I guess my question is like, are, the, are, are you actually, are the examples you're showing some of them classification problems 
Yeah, I mean, okay, so there was a, yeah. there was a range of objectives. I showed some of the robustness curves. Um, uh -huh. In most of those cases, we were state of the art on okay. classification and, and or regression <laughs> or whatever the, uh, I mean, in, for, uh, we had some results on NLP, which I guess I didn't get to know, so it may be a perplexity or some other metric, but um, okay. so, so there, there's a robustness issue B being, yeah, yeah. So, so you, it's of no interest if you're robust and terrible. Right. Um, right. And just in terms of the standards of the area, um, sort of a filter is you got to be beat someone up, right? And so you need to be real good on some classification or, or, or regression right. or some criteria. So the TLDR is, yeah, all of these are competitive in that sense. That they'll, they'll be competitive with the prior models in, in terms of, um, and, and, and this is what I mean, while maintaining state-of-the-art generalization performance. So, um, so yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, you can argue about whether on those plots, the third digit of, you know, is 98.3 versus 98.4, a quote, real difference. Um, but you know, we're 98.4, but if we were 98.2, I would have still said we're fine. Um, but yeah, we're state-of-the-art in that sense. Is that what you're asking in terms of classification or regression or those metrics? Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we are like about time. So um, once again, thank you uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, and I will just leave it to my co-host to introduce the next speaker. So thank you again, Michael. All right, thank you.